Hi there, Couch Potato Mike here. The following video you are about to watch contains, or may contain, language of an adult nature, adult situations, adult scenarios, and possibly a whole bunch of naughty stuff. So viewer discretion is advised. If you are under the age of 18, please switch over to one of my non-naughty videos, I guess. See you next time. Are the kids gone? Good. Because, hey, what is up? This is Couch Potato Mike coming to you from the book club once again, reading another chapter of E.L. James's Freed, which is Fifty Shades Freed as told by Christian, Christian Gray, Gray, Christian Gray. Anyway, uh, now I believe that we were on chapter nine last time while we left off off uh, after finishing chapter eight. So here we are. Let's get right into chapter nine, shall we? Which is Friday, July the 8th of 2011. Dr. Flynn rubs his chin, and I don't know if he's playing for time or genuinely intrigued. She threatened you? She threatened to leave? Yes. Seriously. Yes. So you capitulated. I didn't have much choice. Christian, you always have a choice. Do you think Anastasia was being unreasonable? I meet his gaze, and I want to shout yes, but deep down I know Anna isn't un an unreasonable person. That's you, Gray. Unreasonable could be your middle name. Anna's words haunt me. She said that long ago. Christ, my t negativity is a real prick sometimes. How are you feeling now? Flynn asks. Wary, I whisper, and my admission is a jab to the solar plexus, almost winding me. She could leave me. Ah, your feelings of insecurity and abandonment are coming to the fore again. I remain mute, distracted by the sliver of afternoon light that brightens the cluster of many orchids on his coffee table. What can I say? I don't want to admit this out loud. It makes my fears real. I loathe feeling this weak, this exposed. Anna has the power to wound me and deliver a fatal blow. Is it giving you second thoughts about the wedding? John asks. No. Maybe. I'm afraid she'll hurt me. Like she did before, when she left. No, I answer, because I don't want to lose her. He nods, as if this is what he wants to hear. You've relinquished a great deal for her. I have. I stifle my indulgent smile. She's a good negotiator. Flynn rubs his chin again. Do you resent that? Yes, partly. I've given so much and she won't give me this. You sound like you're mad at her. I am. Have you thought about telling her that? How mad I am? No. Why not? I'm worried I'll say something I'll regret and she'll leave. She left once before. But you hurt her then. I did. The memory of her tearful face and her bitter rebuke are never far from my mind. You are one fucked up son of a bitch. I shudder, but I hide it from Flynn. Whenever I think of that time, my shame almost swallows me whole. I don't want to hurt her again, ever. That's a good goal to work toward, Flynn says. But you need to find a healthy way to express and channel your anger. You've directed it inwardly for so long, too long, he pauses. But you know my views on that. I'm not going to rehash that now, Christian. You're incredibly resilient and resourceful. You had the solution to this impasse all along. You capitulated. Problem solved. Life is not always going to go your way. The key is to recognize those moments. Sometimes it's better to concede the battle to win the war. Communicate and compromise. That's what a marriage is all about. I snort, remembering Anna's email from a lifetime ago. What's so funny? Nothing. I shake my head. Have a little faith in yourself. And in her. Marriage is a huge leap of faith, I mumble. It is, for everyone. But you're well equipped to cope. Focus on where you want to be. How you want to be. I think you have, over the last few weeks, you've seemed happier. I meet his gaze. This is just a small setback, he says. I hope so. I'll see you next week. It's dusk, and Elian and I are standing on the terrace of the new house, admiring the view. 
I can see why you bought the place. Elliot whistles his appreciation through his teeth. We're both quiet for a moment, absorbing the majesty of twilight over the sound, the opal sky, the distant orange haze, the dark purple waters, the beauty, the calm. Stunning, isn't it? I murmur. Yup, this is a great spot for a beautiful home, which you're going to remodel. I grin, and Elliot play punches my arm. Glad I can help. It's going to take some hard work, and it ain't going to be cheap to make this place more sustainable. But hey, you can afford it. I'll talk to Gia next week and see what she has in mind, and if it's possible. I'll close on this sometime before the end of July. I think Aunt... I think Anna, you, Gia, and I should meet here once that's done. Do it before. It doesn't sound like the results of any survey will stop you from buying this place. You're right. I'll look at my schedule. When do you think you might have time? For what? The build, dude. The build. Ah. Well, if the Spokane Eden project stays on schedule, maybe early fall. He shrugs. It's going well? Yeah. Elliot looks pleased with himself. He should. It's an ambitious project, and once complete, it will be a showcase for his sustainable building methods. He shoves a Seahawks cap back on his head and claps his hands together. TJIF, hotshot. Let's get back to your place and get our beer on. Rolling my eyes, I follow my big brother around the side of the house to where my car is parked in the driveway. I wonder what our women are doing, Elliot says as we drive back to Escala. Packing up Anna's things, I hope. I glance at Elliot. He's got his fucking foot on my dashboard, and he's watching the passing scenery as if he doesn't give a shit. Lord, I envy him. They're probably eating pizza, drinking too much wine, and talking about us. I hope they're not talking about us. Or they could be watching the game, he cackles. Kate into baseball? Yeah, she likes all sports. Of course she does. I'm once more confounded by why she and Anna are friends. Anna doesn't seem interested in sports at all, though we both enjoyed watching the Mariners recently. So, do you think of Kate as your woman, then? I ask, curious. Yeah, for now. It's not serious between you? He shrugs. She's cool. We'll see. She doesn't hassle me, you know. I don't know, thank God, I mutter to myself and shake my head. This might be the longest relationship he's ever experienced. Let's stop at a bar, he says. No, I'm not drinking and driving. Dude, you're driving like dad. Fuck off, asshole. I put my foot down and the R8 screeches up the on-ramp onto I-5, and we speed toward the city. Have you found the prick who totaled your chopper? I sigh. Helicopter, Elliot, and no. It's really pissing me off. Man, who would want to do that? I don't know. My team has turned up zilch. I'm waiting for the report from the NTSB. They're taking their sweet time. I've had to up our security. I've got two guys watching Anna and Kate's place tonight. No kidding. Don't blame you, man. There are some wackos out there. I give him a look. What? I'm just stating the obvious. I'm glad they'll be safe, he says, and I'm beginning to think he might really care for Kavanaugh. What do you want to do for your bachelor party, he asks as we come off I-5. Elliot, I don't want or need a bachelor party. Man, you up and f marry the first girl who's given you any serious attention. Of course you need a bachelor party. I laugh. Dude, you have no idea. I thought you'd knocked her up. I go cold. Fuck off, bro. I'm not that careless. And it's far too young for kids. We have a life to live before we get into all that shit. Elliot laughs. You with kids. That'll loosen you up. I ignore him. Have you heard from Mia? She's chasing cock. What? Kate's brother. I don't think he's interested. I dislike the words cock and Mia in the same sentence. She's not a kid anymore, hotshot. You know, she's only slightly younger than Anna and Kate. I'd rather not think about that. Are we playing pool or watching the game? He wisely changes the subject. Whatever you want, bro, whatever you want. We pull into the underground garage at Escala while I'm still trying not to think about Mia and Ethan Cavanaugh. Elliot is snoring in front of the TV. He works too damn hard. He plays too damn hard. But he'll sleep off 
his overcompensation of beer in the spare bedroom. Sorry, overconsumption. He'll sleep off his overconsumption of beer in the spare bedroom. One of those days, huh, guys? We've had a chill evening. We watched highlights of the Mariners-Angels game. Mariners lost. He thrashed me at Call of Duty, but I want a pool for a change. Tomorrow morning, I'll be at Anna's apartment to help her move the rest of her belongings here. It's taken enough time. I glance at my watch, wondering what she might be doing. My phone buzzes, and it's as if she's heard my thoughts. Anna. I'm packed, missing you, sleep well, no nightmares, this is not a request, I'm not there to hold you, love you, heart. Her words warm my heart. Flynn said our recent fight was just a small setback, I hope he's right. I text back, dream of me, I hope to dream of you, no nightmares. Promise? No promises, just hope and dreams and love for you. You once said you don't do romance. I'm so glad that you're wrong. I'm swooning here. I love you, Christian. Good night, XXX. Good night, Anna. I like to make you swoon. I love you always, X. All right, and so concludes chapter nine. Surprisingly enough, another sex-free chapter in this book. Big misconception about these books is that it's just sex, sex, sex the entire time. And there's a lot of story to it. I mean, yes, when it does get into sex, it gets very graphic. Which is, I mean, I think it's a perfect combination of the both as to why these books have sold so great. I personally like the story. One time I actually, um, I was watching what turned out to be a bootlegged version of one of the movies. And it's funny, it must have been from some company. Uh, from some country that's very prudish because they literally cut every single sex scene out of it. It was the second movie. I remember that. And they'd cut out every single sex scene. But I like to think that uh, even if these books didn't have all the sex scenes in them, they would still just be damn good books. The sex scenes, I guess, are just a bonus for some people. I mean, it started off from the woman's point of view and now it's the man's point of view. I still don't know a lot of men that actually uh, read these books or listen to them, watch the movies, or whatnot. Except for me. I really enjoy them. I hope you're enjoying them, too. So, uh, that's going to do it for this episode. So, just uh, remember, guys, to subscribe and ring that bell icon so you know when the next video is coming out. Uh, also, give me a like. Give me a thumbs up, guys, because it helps me with that damn algorithm. And comment. I love reading your comments. Comment down below on any uh, books that you'd like to see me read after this. But for now, that is going to do it. So for the Couch Potato Mike YouTube channel, this is Couch Potato Mike reminding you, as always, that life is an experiment and your results may vary. See you next time.